I'm delighted to be joined in conversation this month by Katie McManaman. Katie, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks, Paul. How are you? Good stuff. I'm very well. Thanks for asking. <laughs> thanks very much for taking the time to, to speak to us this evening. You're currently working at the, the Racing Academy and the Centre of Excellence for Young Jockeys as a riding instructor. But first of all, I want to ask you about how did you first get involved in, in horse racing? Um, a similar story to other people, I suppose. Um, my dad rode as an apprentice. Uh, he rode for Peter McCre McCreary back in the day. Um, and then from there, he went on to build like hurdles and fences uh, for Punchstown, Ferry House, Navin, a lot of the kind of tracks around the place. So, you know, we were always carted around to the races when we were small and um, racing was always in the background. We had ponies, like we had dogs, you know, they were always around. And then um, a man moved in up the road uh, called Peter Mooney, who trained about 10 or 15 horses. And I used to ride my pony up there and kind of went on to riding a few of the quieter ones for him. And we had a local young young lad called Mick O'Connell, who was in the apprentice school in Kildare Town. And he was telling me about it. And like straight away, I was like, yeah, absolutely. That's for me. Um, I was never, I never really enjoyed school at that age, you know, and not into horses and as soon as I kind of realized there was another pathway for me to carry on and I could continue education to a level of um four with VTAC it was kind of an easy way to get around my mom and she let me go and it kind of just it went all from there then I went to the apprentice school and that's got me hooked then I was away. And um, How long did you spend in the, the apprentice school? Uh, 10 months Um, it's the same uh, length of course as it is today um, and I done my uh, work placement with John Mulhern, um, which was amazing. He was a great boss. And I really wanted to race ride as everybody does when they're 16 and want, you know, they all want to be a jockey. So I um, ended up going down to Boris and Carlo to Sean Tracy. And I was with him as an apprentice for a couple of years and then went on to be his head girl for a few years after that as well. So. Um Katie, you mentioned you were mad to get a few rides on the track and you want to be a jockey. You did have a number of rides on the track. You managed to have a, a few placed efforts and you managed to, to ride a winner, which was a fantastic achievement. That must have given you a real thrill. Oh, um, to this day, one of the best days of my life. Um, it was in my local race course in Nace and all my family were there. Everybody in the local pub backed it. I think it was 14 or 16 to 1, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, it was amazing yeah it, it really was you know looking back on it um, I really felt that you know I, I I wouldn't say a regret because I wouldn't be where I am now without the path I've taken but I, I don't think I was mentally disciplined enough at the time to kind of control my weight and you know I got caught up in um, you know just kind of working away and having the crack and you know, I, I kind of wish I'd been a little bit more disciplined and probably tried a bit harder. You know, Sean was his best for me. He used to have me out running the roads and, you know, he gave me absolutely every opportunity he could have given me. And when I rode my winner then, I don't know, I just kind of had it in my head. I was like, well, that's grand now. I've done that now. Grand. And um, he then kind of um, promoted me to head girl and I was still quite young. But when I became head girl, I, I just tried with it. Um, being given responsibility and I kind of found I was more suited to that I think in the end It's interesting you say that maybe you, you thought in your opinion now with the benefit of hindsight obviously and, and years of experience that you maybe weren't disciplined enough and we might touch on that later on but after your apprenticeship in Ireland you went, you spent a period in Australia Tell us yeah, about that um, Yeah I went to Australia actually when I gave up my apprenticeship I, I went to work in the bookies for um, a couple of years I just kind of, even at that age, um, like when I gave up working for Sean, I, I kind of wanted a, a different skill set. You know what I mean? It was always in the back of my mind that I wasn't going to be able to have the horses forever. So I got a different skill set from that. And then a friend of mine who was actually set up by Helena Sullivan um, got an opportunity to go to Australia for six weeks. And she rang me and she was like, what do you want to come for the six weeks? And I was like, please, yeah, I'd love to. So I went out for six weeks and I ended up staying four and a half years. So that'll tell you how much I enjoyed it. <laughs> um, and I definitely think for anybody, you know, that was looking to branch out and travel, Australia is incredible. Um, for opportunity, for learning, um, it's a completely different way of doing things. It's a different lifestyle. Um, yeah, I'd absolutely recommend it. The only thing is, 
it's very, very far away from home, you know. Yeah, and you mentioned you were in Australia four and a half years. What year did you, when did you decide to return back to return home to Ireland? Um, I came home in the summer of 2014. Um, I'd nearly done five years out there and, you know, I, it was kind of time to come home. I, I had always been a home bird. I like, I love Ireland. You know, it was never my intention to stay out there that long anyway. If it, if Australia was a little bit closer to Ireland, maybe I would have stayed, but, um, I'd be coming home at Christmas and I'd be crying going back on the plane and, you know, but it, it's funny how life works out. Like when I came home in that summer, you know, I, nieces and nephews due to be born and, um, my dad had a stroke and, you know, I was kind of thinking, how would I deal with this if I was so far away? So it ended up being the right decision to come home. A huge culture shock as well after being away for so long, you know. Yeah, I can only imagine. And was it hard, difficult finding work when you, when you returned back to Ireland? Um, it wasn't difficult to find work in regards to getting into a yard. Um, you know, like I, I'm sure you're aware there's always some sort of a staff crisis in in Ireland in regards to staff and exercise riders and stuff like that I suppose I came back and like I said it was a huge culture shock it's a very different way of um work-life balance in Australia and then when I came home I forgot um you know with the weather and in Australia you're doing mornings only and you're in the sunshine you go to the beach after work and you know, I, I kind of forgot how hard it, it was. Um, so I came home and I wrote out Freddie Lynham, um, which was brilliant. And I kind of was like, you know what, I, I was getting a bit old. I was, well, not old, but I was 26, 27 at that stage. And I was like, okay. geez, like, I, I don't know how long more I can do this for. I need to kind of progress in some way or form. So in regards to getting a job, it wasn't hard. But kind of getting a job that I wanted was hard. It's the way I put it, you know. Um, so I think it's fair fair to say you're at a at a crossroads at that period. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and I I really I didn't know what direction my life was going to go, and I was thinking of leaving the industry, and that put the fear of God in me, like because I I love working with horses, um, you know, and I knew I I want to be involved in racing. I couldn't imagine myself being involved in anything else. So. I was very lucky um, kind of a constant in my life as sort of mentor um, who I'm sure you're familiar with her, uh, Helen O'Sullivan, who works for the Jockeys Trust. Um, yes. We met her when I was in race and she kind of, um, she, she's been just a constant in my life. Like anytime I needed direction or advice, I go to Helen. And um, so I was kind of speaking with her and she just was very kind of straight with me. And she was like, well, what do you want to do? And I kind of went through what my skill set was, uh, what I enjoyed doing and how I could do that in the racing industry. And when she put pen to paper kind of for me, she was like, look, like I kind of said to her, you know, I love um, when I was in Australia, I was an assistant trainer. And we get a lot of um, kind of the equivalent to school leavers, kind of false kids coming in that have done writing. And Philip, uh, the man I worked for in Australia, would take on a lot of these kind of boys and girls and stuff. And I loved teaching them. I loved kind of showing them the ropes and, you know, the proper way to do I got great joy from it. So I was telling her this and she was like, what about an instructor job in race? And I was like, oh my God, like, that'd be amazing. Them jobs are a few and far between. So um, I spoke to Keith Rowe and he was like, look, you're on the radar. We're not looking for anyone now. In the meantime, you need to um, get some sort of qualification to even think about, you know, qualifying. That's just the way the world has gone now can't all be down to experience you know yeah so, um Helen um then she was amazing she had a look at what I needed to do and she put me um in touch with new college and I done what was called a train to trainer uh to a level seven so if anybody was ever thinking of doing anything like that uh basically what it is is you can teach people to a level two levels below what you've achieved. So say I've achieved a level seven and a trained a trainer. I can teach people up to a level five. Um, and what I would teach is horsemanship. Um, in that course, there was chefs, there was um, accountants, there was childcare, there was all these different kind of people in different areas doing the same course. So it can be applied to anything, really. It's just um, basically just teaching you how to teach, basically, like, you know, so um, that was kind of life changing as well, going back to college at that age. And 
I left school when I was 15, like fairly, I wouldn't say read or write, but my literacy wasn't amazing by any means. Um, it was a huge challenge, but definitely one of the best things I've ever did as well. So the Irish Jockeys Trust and Helen O'Sullivan, they pointed you in the direction of, of further education or, or life of skill and lifelong learning. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. How important is, is education or, or upskilling? Uh, huge, hugely, hugely important. Like, um, you know, like I said, experience nowadays, uh, the world has changed. You know what I mean? You're, um, you don't, apprenticeships are slowly, I think, coming back into Ireland. But for about 15 years there, you know, nobody went done apprenticeships anymore. Everyone went to college. And I think um, I really see it in race now. The pal- not the caliber of students, but it's a different level of students we're getting in now compared to when I was in race. Um, a lot of people are just finishing school, it's engraved in them, and they go to college. So you're competing with people that have degrees and all this thing to kind of get the good jobs. I like, suppose so you need to have some formal education behind you 100% if you want to progress, I think. And you're like you had years of experience in the, the horse racing industry as a as a jockey and as an assistant trainer, but it's fair to say you wouldn't be where you are now as a riding instructor in in race without your your level seven. No, absolutely not. Um, like I had done my level seven and I was still waiting um almost a year before I got a phone call to go to race and that was only at a part time basis. Um, I ended up um. Just I went uh, HRI do a racing panel every couple of years. You can apply there, and um, I apply for that. And again, I think the level seven, even though it was a train to trainer and it wasn't really relevant to working in the registration department in horse race, race in Ireland, I think it showed the fact that I was kind of willing to learn and grow. And then um, I kind of got I got ended up working in registrations, and then from there I went to work for Care under uh, Carol Nolan. And care is the education and work based department in HRI. And Carol, like an amazing woman as well, she got me doing communication courses, um, you know, strategic thinking, all this kind of stuff. And just um all that has stood to me, you know, and they were only little day courses here and there. And they stood to me, there was something else to put on paper, you know what I mean? So I think absolutely. Community. Do you know, pick up anything that you can get done, get it done, I think. You mentioned the, the standard of students you're getting into to race at the moment and how people are, you know, a lot more students are leaving second level, secondary schools and going on to, to third level education and getting degrees. Do you think for jockeys or people working in the industry here in Ireland that there's enough supports there for anybody who is at a, at a crossroad? Um, I, I do think for jockeys, um, there, there is support there. Um, you know, I, I think though, um, I don't know if it's the mindset of jockeys that are riding, they're very much in the zone and they're not, um, they're not thinking about what the future, you know, could hold for them. It isn't until they kind of, look, I'm only speaking from experience, but I think when, when things are going good, it's a one, it's a, it's a fixed mindset. Like, this is what I want to do. You're not thinking about anything else. And then when things are going bad, you know, whether it's a pride thing or whether it's a fear thing, um, you know, jo- jockeys and the ones that I would know, they're not very, um, some of the, not all of them, but like, it's not, it's not easy to ask, ask for help. Do you know what I mean? And um, I think the Jockeys Trust, the Indra Jockeys do an amazing job. Um, you know, and putting themselves out there, letting them know what's available. Care have developed this jockey pathway as well. I think there's great value in that. Um, but sure, look, you could always do more in, you know, it, it's a work in progress. I don't, I think it's always going to be looked at and improved. Um, I think uh, for stable staff, I definitely think more could be done um, for the stable staff. But, you know, that that's a work in progress as well. And times are changing for them as well, I think. But I, I do think if it, you know, you need to ask for help. You can't, you can't have things thrown at you. You know, you have to kind of want to do it and look to do it. And like I said, I went to Helen and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And she just helped me put pen to paper and look at what I, what I liked, what I wanted to do and what I enjoyed doing and what I was able to do. And we formed a plan, do you know? And like, yeah. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Like I know Helen O'Sullivan and, and Frank Moran, they've worked tirelessly for years behind the scenes at the 
the Irish Jockeys Trust and trying to, to help people. And as you say, in one hand, yeah, the, you know, you, you must look for help yourself, but I think it's fine in realising that, that the help is, that there is support there, that the help is there. The, the Irish Jockeys Trust are, are there for, for people who need it. Yeah, yeah. And they are there, and I think they do a good job uh, promoting the help available. Do you know what I mean? They're, look, it's it's hard to get out there, especially with COVID nowadays as well. Like, do you know what I mean? It's um, yeah. You can't be making yourself as visible as you want to be. You're relying on social media platforms and stuff like that. So even doing little videos like this, Paul, I think is a great promotion for the sports that are out there, you know? Absolutely. And I hope even if it helps one person, it's it's, you know, I think it's done its job. Obviously, yeah. we'd like to help more, you know. Um, yeah. I was going to ask you, what would you do different? But you mentioned earlier on in the interview that, you know, as, as a the benefit of hindsight and, and years of experience, you were maybe a little bit, I suppose, immature or maybe, yeah. I wouldn't say what, just, I suppose, part and parcel of growing up. So, yeah. And, I, you know, I just thought everything was going to happen very quick and it was very easy. And then when it didn't, I was quite happy to just be like, oh, I've ridden my winner, that's enough. You know what I mean? Um, I'm not the person I was then that I am now. And if I could have this brain back when I was 16, <laughs> you know, we're sure that that is life. And, you know, I, I'm very, very happy in where I am now. And it's been a journey and definitely ups and downs. But sure, who hasn't had ups and downs in their life? Like, you know. That's it. And with the benefit of that experience, what advice do you give young jockeys now on, on upskilling or personal development as they go through their career? Yeah, in, in fairness to race, um, that's a huge aspect of the course. You know what I mean? Um, you know, you've Keith Rowe there, who's all about um, bringing people in. We have sports psychologists, uh, Paula Hearn, amazing. Um, you know, we do a lot of, uh, you know, they do an hour a week on personal development and, you know, kind of having a bit of time to think for themselves. Uh, I suppose to be fair to the, the trainees that we get in, they are 16, 17. Um, they're there with the fixed mindset, I want to be a jockey, you know, and the last thing you want to do is go around bursting their bubble saying, well, you know, you might not be a jockey. <laughs> um, I suppose everybody kind of tries to relay the importance of getting their level four and five while they're there. Um, we've developed the level five horsemanship award, which is another progression route for them. Um, so that's another thing. And then, you know, we do our best to make them aware that we are here, if there is some, like, I, I'm only there five years, but I would have trainees from five years ago bring me and say, look, I, I don't know what to do now. I'm thinking of going to Aldi or I don't know what to do. And, you know, we say, well, why don't you come in and do the racing secretary course? You know, you're going to get computer skills. You're going to get this and that. And that's going to stand to you. Um, I think uh, what I personally what I would always say to them is you know nothing is forever and if you have to drop out of the industry for a few years like I did and then come back like nothing is set in stone and um, the retirement age in Ireland I always remind them is, is to like 65 so you know they're only starting their work career and even if they're 30 and they're at a bit of a crossover you can always go back and study you know everyone in Ireland is entitled to a degree of some sort and um, so yeah, I suppose I just you know I try and always even open door with them that they can always come back and ask them like certain questions and I mean that's all you can do. I I, I think well I say that we can always do more, but <laughs> that's <laughs> I mean. um I would love to do more, but it's just ways and means. And if you keep harping on at them as well, that you know they'll just glaze over. Something has to stick. Yeah, yeah, they're there to be jockeys. That's that's what they want to do. You know. Yeah, yeah. No, it's great stuff and. Where would Katie McMahon man like to, to see herself in five years' time? Um, I suppose I'm really into, um, you know, kind of helping people progress. Uh, I'm actually hoping, because um, I have a young son at the minute, but I know that's no excuse, but I would love, love to go back to college. I'd love to do something like career coaching. Um, okay. It's kind of where my interests lie. I, I really enjoy it. I love seeing people progress and... You know, um, I think, again, that's probably Helena Sullivan, probably in my ear. You know, I, I find her very inspiring in the work she does. Uh, and I, I'd love to do kind of something similar. Um, I'd love to get involved in the Stable Staff Association. Um, and I, I'd love to also progress in my role in race because I'm very lucky. I really love my job there as well. So we'll see, hopefully. 
bigger things ahead. <laughs> yeah, and we wish you all the best with that, Katie. But I've got one final question for you. What is your favourite memory or memories, a standout moments from your, your years of working in the horse racing industry? Um, well, like I said, riding my my winner was was huge. Um, I still I have it so clear in my mind from a, such a long time ago. It was amazing. Um, you know, I've been very lucky. I, I've got to travel around Australia for months with um, Group 1 horses and that that was incredible um and look this i i really get enjoyment from seeing graduates ride winners like we've um adam farraher there nikita kane they were in my first year when i started working in race again unreal goals wow. seeing them riding winners yeah like you know just so proud of them like you know so yeah they're yeah they're probably my biggest highlights like you know well, Katie, I'm just going to mention here before we go that if anybody is at the crossroads, you can get on the Facebook page and give the Irish Jockeys Trust a like. Or alternatively, you can telephone the Irish Jockeys Trust on 045-521-848. Katie McManaman, thank you very much for your time and we wish you every success in the future. Thanks, Paul. Thank you.